Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. President Trump is right now leaving California, where he received a briefing on the deadly and devastating wildfires during a short stop on his campaign swing of the rest. More than 16,000 firefighters are currently battling 29 active fires in California right now. Western wildfires this year have burned millions of acres and killed at least 35 people. The policy differences on environmental issues between President Trump and Democratic challenger uh, Joe Biden could not be clearer. Biden, echoing scientific consensus, noted this afternoon that the increasing frequency and intensity of these severe weather events demonstrate a, a need, in his view, to tackle the climate crisis. President Trump, conversely, seems to be blaming Californians for not sufficiently raking leaves in the forest and continuing uh, better forest management, uh, even though, as the governor just pointed out to President Trump, the vast majority of the forests in California are, are federal. And President Trump's push against climate science is something that one California official took issue with today when he met President Trump. And we're seeing this warming trend make our summers warmer, but also our winters warmer as well. If we ignore that science and sort of put our head in the sand and think it's all about vegetation management, we're not going to succeed together protecting Californians. Okay. It'll start getting cooler. I you wish just, you just watch. I wish science agreed with you. <laughs> hey, well, I don't think science knows actually. The, the fires are just, are just one matter of life and death that President Trump is, is facing right now in his job as he ignores the science of climate change, as you saw in that clip. He is also ignoring the science of the coronavirus pandemic, holding a crowded indoor rally with thousands in attendance, few masks in sight. President Trump, in holding that rally, was defying local restrictions in Nevada, as well as guidance given by the White House Coronavirus Task Force, also defying simple common sense. As the U.S. approaches 195,000 deaths from COVID-19, less than 5% of the world's population, more than 20% of the coronavirus deaths worldwide, according to official statistics. It's a comparative failure with any other Western wealthy nation. And now CNN has exclusively ob obtained a new recording of President Trump talking to author Bob Woodward with President Trump a month ago today, bewilderingly insisting that he could not have done anything more to save lives, as CNN's Caitlin Collins reports. With fires ravaging the West Coast, President Trump made a brief stop in California to assess the damage after being criticized for largely staying silent on the devastation he's blamed on forest management. There has to be good, strong forest management, which I've been talking about for three years. As he met with California Governor Gavin Newsom in a stop added two days ago, the trip only emphasized Trump's reluctance to accept climate change. Trees fall down after a short period of time, about 18 months, they become very dry. They become really like a matchstick. Also leaves, when you have years of leaves, dried leaves on the ground, it just sets it up. 
Scientists have concluded it's greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels that are making the fires longer lasting and more damaging. Is there a climate change issue in California? Uh, you'll have to ask the governor that question. I don't want to step on his toes. But please uh, respect, and I know you do, uh, the difference of opinion out here as it relates to this fundamental issue on the issue of climate change. Former Vice President Joe Biden said Trump doesn't listen to the experts. If you give a climate arsonist four more years in the White House, why would anyone be surprised if we have more America blaze? The president's visit coming after he held a rally with thousands of people indoors yesterday, blatantly defying the governor of Nevada's order limiting indoor gatherings to 50 people. Many in the audience weren't wearing masks, and Trump openly mocked the governor's restriction. And if the governor comes after you, which he shouldn't be doing, I'll be with you all the way. Trump told the Las Vegas Review Journal that the limitations didn't apply to him and he wasn't worried about getting COVID-19 from being in the room. No, I'm not concerned. I'm, not I'm more concerned, concerned about how close you are. <laughs> the revelation that Trump knew the dangers of coronavirus came from Bob Woodward's book. In new audio obtained by CNN today, Trump repeatedly asked Woodward how the pandemic would affect his re-election chances. So you think the virus totally supersedes the economy? Oh, sure. But they're related, as you know. A little bit, yeah. Trump also told Woodward nothing more could have been done on COVID, despite what Dr. Anthony Fauci told Jake Tapper in April. I mean, obviously, you could logically say that if you had a process that was ongoing and you started mitigation earlier, you could have saved lives. Now, Jake, the president has just left California. He is now on his way to Arizona, where he's going to be holding a Latinos for Trump event, as polls show he is edging Joe Biden out with that group. But I want you to look at the room where the president is going to host this event. We've got our team in the room. See how many chairs there are and how closely they are together. Our team counted over 500 chairs, though. Of course, it's unclear yet if all of them are going to be filled, but it just shows you if so, this is going to be another event where the president is throwing these COVID-19 precautions to the wind, basically. And we know that uh, the virus has struck uh, minority groups, Latinos and African Americans, uh, disproportionately hard. Uh, Caitlin Collins, thanks so much. Joining me now is Congressman John Garamendi of California, a Democrat, and the largest fire in state history is currently burning in his district. The fire is just 30% contained. Uh, Garamendi is also a surrogate for the Biden campaign. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Uh, President Trump today uh, focused on forest management as the solution for alleviating some of the fires and for the problem in the future. You have touted your efforts on preventative forest management uh, to make them more resilient to wildfires. So. Is there any truth to what the president is saying here? Uh, Certainly there is. Certainly we do need to manage the forest better. Certainly there are many things that can be done. Uh, But I noticed he didn't bring a rake with him, nor did he bring money. Uh, That's what it's going to take to do it. And it's only this year that we were able to set up a funding mechanism for the U.S. Forest Service that allows them to manage the forest with some money. Previously, all the money was spent on fighting the fires. Nothing was left to manage the forest. But the issue is far, far bigger than raking the leaves. Uh, It's an issue that we have to deal with climate change. Jake, we knew back in the 1990s, I was deputy secretary at the Department of Interior in the run-up to the Kyoto Climate Conference in 1998. We studied what would happen if the climate got warmer. We predicted exactly what is happening today with hurricanes, with floods, with superstorms, and with fires. We knew the forests were going to die, and here we are 22 years later, and the president denies climate change. This man is a danger, not only the pandemic, but he's a danger to our communities. And also, Congressman, uh, Governor Newsom, California Democratic Governor uh, Newsom today, Uh, pointed out to President Trump that a majority uh, of the forests in California, I think I I think I have this right, uh, are federal lands and it's a small minority that are that are state lands. Is that correct? And how does that relate to this issue of uh, management management of the forests? Well, as I said a moment ago, when talking about federal uh, forest money, Previously, the money was consumed in fighting fires. There was nothing left over to manage. We now have a new funding mechanism in place. We do need to manage the forests. And 
the great majority of forests in California are federal, but the fires are occurring not only in the federal forest, but they're also occurring on private lands, and they are occurring in our cities, certainly as you saw in Oregon. We're having firestorms in our cities, in our suburbs, in the cities, and it is directly related to climate change. Yeah. We know this. Unfortunately, the president simply refuses to accept the responsibility that is his. Thank God Biden made it very, very clear what he will do as president. He will address these issues. So uh, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti was on State of the Union yesterday, and he suggested to me that in his view, President Trump responds to disasters in Republican-leaning states uh, more quickly and more aggressively than he does when the disasters are in Democratic-leaning states. Take a listen. And from the president, I wish that we would get as much attention not based on an electoral map, but just purely on being Americans and the need for leadership to be uh, from the White House for all of America. Do you agree with that sentiment? President Trump is more readily offering support to Americans in, in primarily Republican-led states like, like Texas or, Louis, uh, well, let's say Texas? Well, we certainly know that the president is paying attention to the red states and even more so to the states that are in play, the swing states. Uh, with regard to California, yes, we do need federal help. We do need assistance. And frankly, we need the HEROES bill. Unfortunately, the president refuses to recognize that state local governments around this nation, red, blue, independent, whomever, swing and not, are all hurting for money. And so the HEROES bill, which is in play, which is unfortunately not in play here in the Senate, has to provide the money that these local governments need, not just to sustain the firefight, but also all of the other, the fighting the coronavirus, the testing, the tracing, mm -hmm. all of those things. And I must go back and just, Biden gave an exceptional speech earlier today, just ahead of the president, and the stark difference between a Biden that's looking to the future, protecting America from all of the climate catastrophes that are already with us, and a president that simply denies that there even exists such a problem. Um, we've, got to, we've got to make a change. We cannot let time go by any longer without fully addressing the climate crisis, and Biden laid it out clearly what he would do. It is Tuesday, the 15th of September of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. Now, don't use too much. It might make a difference in your own personal life for a temporary moment, but you'll see a difference. <laughs> don't don't use more than a pinch or a scant dash. Okay. Uh, oh, one other thing. We do put roasted corn in the chowder here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, forewarned. But, uh, you know, we like the flavor profile plus the, uh, the textures. Come on. It's a holistic experience. Even in the virtual world. Okay, uh, we have a wildfire uh, situation here. <laughs> yes, they're everywhere. You know, it's pretty good. We're right in the exact spot we're supposed to be, right in the middle of it all. Uh, so we do have a pretty thick marine layer, and our temperatures have been going down pretty well into the uh, mid-40s upper 40s uh, at night, which really helps in suppressing some of the fire. More moisture in the air helps as well. <sighs> We've been looking at the forecast for rain, and I've got to, you know, sometimes it's like uh, when you're gone on a diet, you don't want to check your weight every day. Okay, let it go for a bit. Then you'll see you'll see some uh, marked improvement. But if you're checking it every day or <laughs> multiple times during the day, it it might make you discouraged. So just don't, you know, it's good to let it go for a little bit and come back to it. And I normally would do this with the weather, especially with forecasts of rain when you've been living in Droughtville. And now I, I, I'm i falling prey to this. Oh, God, there's there's like a half there's a half percent of a chance of rain in, a, in about 10 days. 
And you hold on to that, and then suddenly it disappears. You go, oh, my God, I have a percent. It, was, it wasn't much, but it was something to hold on to. So uh, we did have some forecasts for rain starting on Thursday early. Now they're saying it will be on Mon- I mean on Friday early, with possible uh, some on Thursday late. Now don't don't do this. I mean, shouldn't we have Caputo manipulating the data just so that we feel better and Trump doesn't look bad? I mean, come on. Our feelings are more important than the facts. It's true. I don't get this either, how everybody is bending over backwards in all departments of government to appease Trump's ego. I don't get it. I I, I thought we were America. I mean, yeah, he's the executive, and by date of that fact, we're supposed to be holding him in some sort of, you know, hey, arm's length. Like, we like you, but we're going to make sure you're doing the right thing. And if you don't do the right thing, you know, uh, we are. We the people. Well, I guess we the people are now considered the enemy of the state. (laughs) Wow. So it it still astounds me how people will just bend over backwards for this guy. And he's a dimwit. He's a bully. He's a mobster. He's a spoiled rich boy. He's a materialist. He's selfish. He's greedy. He's a libertine. My God, you think there would be some sort of, I don't know, moral fortitude somewhere? Well, there is. Unfortunately, what those folks do in protest is to resign. And then who gets to fill the vacuum? People like Caputo. Now, I got to say, Caputo was personally paid by Vlad to be his spokesman. Yeah, albeit 20 years ago. But so what? It's not as if he hasn't had contact with anybody in the Russian sphere since. I mean, he worked with Manafort, my God. (laughs) So now we have Caputo. And how many acting secretaries of state? How many acting deputy secretaries of state? Or just secretaries across the whole administration? How many are acting? Because they cannot get a Senate confirmation. Just can't. And in many instances, they're not even getting a hearing because it would divulge how much of a criminal they are. And I guess, you know, if you're a mobster, you can't, uh, you know, I mean, you can't convict yourself. (laughs) It's right there in the Constitution. You have a Fifth Amendment right not to convict yourself. (laughs) Okay. Well, uh, then you got Bill Barr. You know, we're in for a big time trouble. And they're already projecting. I mean, they're already out there, Roger Stone telling Trump, oh, yeah, the Insurrection Act. (laughs) And then and then you talk to Trump people and they go, oh, yeah, this is totally normal. Uh, a third of the voting block, the toxic third that is always with us. Look, I'm for I'm all for putting them back in the nether regions of whatever. They are a marginal group and they should be treated as such. Yeah, I would say with some disdain and insult. There are many people that say, oh, we can't do that. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm tired of it. For how many decades was liberal a pejorative? Okay? And then we say deplorable and the whole world has to stop. We got to bring out the paramilitaries. We got to bring out Eric Prince to help help the, uh, the local constabulary crackheads. Because they insulted my people. And his people are low-information voters who don't know shit, but really want to be able to tell the coloreds to go back where they came from. And they've been denied that for so long, and they are tired of it. It's like, I don't know, being cooped up during a pandemic. It's like cabin fever. I just I can't stand it. i got to go out in public and show my bigotry. It's the only way I can be. Which was uh, exemplified here in my little town of Rogue River. 
when we had a little racial equality demonstration of sorts where we were going to have a little barbecue at the Arboretum, the, the park, and everybody gets to do that. Every group from, you know, teach a little kid how to be a marksman and we'll supply the weapons and ammunition. You know, I mean, they advertise that in the schools. It's all part of the schools. They got their little Christian uh, athletic groups. So then you have a racial equality group want to rent the Arboretum, have a barbecue. Well, I not rent the whole thing, but, you know, you got to have a permit to have a, you know, a fairly large group. The word of that got out and uh, one of the right wing Trump people uh, reserved it for them. They got the heads up from the city council. So, and this, and this had transpired once again, I'll remind folks, this had transpired because of a, during our Thursday workshops, a group was asked to come in to give a workshop on systemic racism. Not even 10 minutes into the presentation, the police chief and other members of the council said, well, it doesn't, there's no racism systemic or otherwise in Rogue River. So we really don't need you now, do we? But it was a little bit more vociferous and insulting and demeaning than that. And the woman leading that uh, presentation left in such a uh, fearful state. She was uh, concerned. She was way concerned. So concerned that she took her and her daughter and went into hiding. So this racial equality demonstration arose because of that incident. And the response by the city council was to undermine a peaceful demonstration every inch of the way. Call their goon squads, their constituency, I suppose, to come out and intimidate a group of racial equality people who suddenly now don't have a parade permit. Don't have a place to go in town. So we went to the next place where the covered bridge is and Wimmer, Weimer, depending on who you and what you are, to the community center there, signed a contract, made the deposit, and they got bomb threats. And they rescinded that because of the danger to their community. And who was blamed for it? Black Lives Matter. It wasn't even Black Lives Matter. We're talking the Southern Oregon Racial Equality Group. I guess you could say it's Black Lives Matter, but you know Black Lives Matter is like a boogeyman. So what was left? Go in front of City Hall, have your little demonstration, and then I guess we're going to go. No place to have a barbecue. So the response to that, to prove that Rogue River has no systemic racism or racism of any sort, was to have about 300 or more armed, yelling, vigilante-type goons with loud, unmuffled, or if they were muffled, they were glass-packed mufflers, of their big mega trucks with their roll-tie diesel smoke, speedboats on, on trailers revved up. Whatever a speaker began to speak from the Southern Oregon Racial Equality Group. So we got a lovely newsletter, which we get every month, with a note from the mayor who wanted to thank Police Chief Whipple and a slew of other municipal police departments who had descended upon Rogue River because of Black Lives Matter coming to town, bringing their death and destruction. It wasn't Black Lives Matter that called in a bomb threat to the Weimer, Wimmer Community Center, preventing the barbecue to be at that park and facility. It wasn't Black Lives Matter that called up three to four hundred armed right-wing maggots to show up. So thank you, Mayor. Not once did you uh, mention it was the Southern Oregon Racial Equality Group. You called up Black Lives Matter 
And Chief Whipple protected the community from Black Lives Matter, not from the armed goons that live in town, who I will also say they were all a bunch of outside agitators because not all of them came from town. Whereas the Southern Oregon Racial Equality Group, most of us were from town. So that's the way they work. I was called the real bigot and racist here on the Facebook, uh, Southern Oregon Facebook group pages. And why am I called the real racist and bigot? Because I have nothing good to say about anti-immigration. I only complain about racists. I only complain about, I, what am I for? That's what I was asked. What am I for? You're against everything. What are you for? So, of course, you know, I said I'm for, you know, due process and equal protection under law. I'm for voting rights. I'm for a, wom- for a woman's right to choose and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But most of all, I really am for kicking bigots, racist, neo-Nazis, white nationalists, fascists <laughs> to some nether region where they belong, marginalized, insulted, and mocked. That's what I'm for. You know, I'm for America. Why aren't you? Okay, let's get on with the rest of the show here. What is on the rest of the menu? Oh my, we've just gone on and on and on. Of course, at the top, Trump just always has to impose his bully knowledge. Yeah, he knows more than science, doesn't he? Because his gut tells him so. But it was good to see some science official, some official of any sort, challenge Trump. It'll get cooler, just you watch. Wait a second. You know, first the heat was supposed to kill COVID, and now suddenly it's all going to get cooler and the wildfires are just going to go away. Yeah, well, how about planning for the future in the midst of trying to mitigate and solve the one that we have now? Okay. Well, that's the way Trump works. And he's got his uh, whole uh, cult acting the same. Odd. On the rest of the menu, a federal judge issued an arrest warrant for a neo-Nazi podcaster for being in total disregard of court orders associated with the deadly 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. I was accused of making up Nazis. There's no such thing as Nazis in America. I was uh, accused of, you know, now now they're turning against QAnon, using QAnon against us. <laughs> You're just like QAnon. There's no Nazis. And every time I say, hey, I wish you would tell uh, uh, the Autumn Blossom group that they're fake news. How about Stormfront? They're right here. <laughs> they're right here in the valleys. You tell them they're fake news. I dare you. I dare you. <laughs> okay. Well, a federal judge chastised the Trump administration for not producing the census records that she ordered to be filed. They have no respect for the law, and they don't have any respect for order either. And a federal judge is considering whether to order Georgia to dump its new hackable voting machines with hand-marked ballots made out of paper. Which Trump will say, no one's ever done that before. That's wrong. Ah! Yeah, well, you know, you got the hackable voting machines. No wonder he wants to keep them in and keep anybody from voting on a hand-marked paper ballot or a mail-in ballot. Yeah. After the break, we move to the chef's table where scientists express dismay as a giant chunk of Greenland's ice cap breaks off. I think dismay is putting it mildly when it comes to this science. And Russia's ruling party lost its majority in two Siberian city councils targeted by Kremlin-poisoned Alexei Navalny. And in just recent good news, Navalny is awake, giving a thumbs up from his hospital bed in Germany. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, or even a one-time, you can do that through PayPal. And you can find out how to do that. But Patreon, you know, they're about the same now, aren't they? Anyway, if you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink sent to us once a month, boy, that really helps us pay our bills. And I'll also mention once again, we're getting uh, the workhorse machines that need to replace the workhorse machines that are currently working like workhorses uh, replaced so that these workhorses can, you know, be put out to pasture and take it easy for a little bit. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, they've been working pretty darn hard for over four years now. We've been broadcasting 24-7, 365 resistance radio for almost 10 years. Wow. And uh, <laughs> I guess it's our duty. I will also say it's our privilege. And uh, uh, it's been wonderful being able to do this. And we've been able to do this because of your generosity. And you know who you are. Thank you for all that that you've done. And I just got to be honest, we need more of you. And yes, I'm speaking to you. (laughs) I know in these calamitous times, it's tough. But if you're able, please. If not, well, things are going to get better someday soon. Anyway, and we're here to inform, entertain, I don't know, uplift, have a few laughs, Eh, Be jolly. Maybe even uh, look at some links and get the full story. (laughs) Yeah, we're just, we're a gateway drug to something a lot bigger. Really, indeed. But anyway, all joking aside, we would be unable to do this without your help. And we do thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. Just go to at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for doing so. Well, well, doing, taking care of it. That's what he's doing. So, uh, and maybe if you're the praying type, uh, Tom and his family are in the line of fire. And I mean literal flames. So uh, if you could uh, send out some goodwill and uh, some some be safe mantras, uh, I don't know, maybe it might be like a butterfly wing beating somewhere in the world. The next thing you know, it's uh, blowing out the fires, put them out. Okay, if you would like to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at Justice Putnam. All one word, just like it sounds. And I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on social media so you can get the links to the actual reportage. Okay, I'm just here. I'm like a gateway drug. (laughs) You're going to go on to something much bigger. And it will really... Uh, fill you with a lot more information and maybe round out the story some too. That's what we want to have happen. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc. 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 Okay, well, you know, with all that goes on in the world, with these wildfires going on, a pandemic, Trump being whatever Trump is, uh, the rants of the morning have just really been eating up time into the news read. But, oh, okay, it's all right. We're a salon. We have plenty of time. We have other days to catch up. Or just go to the links at the at Daily Co's. Yes, indeed. All right. Uh, oh, I already have this link opened. And it, it is out of the Associated Press by Michael Kunzelman. And a federal judge yesterday, Monday, issued an arrest warrant for a neo-Nazi podcaster, you know, down here in southern Oregon, or up here, depending on your locus of proximity. Um, Apparently, Nazis don't exist. They don't. So I guess this judge is living on fake news. Anyway, this neo-Nazi podcaster promoted and attended a white nationalist rally in Virginia that erupted in... In violence, three years ago. Well, it seems like only yesterday. U.S. District Judge Norman Moon said 
Texas resident Robert Asmador Ray has been in total disregard of court orders in a lawsuit against him and other far-right extremists and groups associated with the August 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. I like that, far-right extremist. You mean fascists? White nationalists? Well, I guess it's so many different kinds of far-right extremists. We'll just call them far-right extremists. Anyway, Moon agreed to hold Ray in civil contempt of court and ordered him to be arrested and brought to Virginia, where the judge said Ray would be jailed until he is questioned under oath by attorneys for the, for the lawsuit's plaintiffs. The court ordered Ray to appear on a video conference earlier on Monday for a deposition by plaintiff's lawyers. It was the third time he failed to show up for a deposition. The judge said, unfortunately, Mr. Ray has not seen fit to appear today as ordered and, or has taken any steps at all to comply, and I see no alternative but to issue a bench warrant for Mr. Ray's arrest. Ray already is wanted on a criminal charge stemming from the tiki torchlit march through the University of Virginia. On the eve of the rally, plaintiff's lawyer Jessica Phillips told Moon, A warrant for Ray's arrest was issued in June of 2018 after a grand jury indicted him on a felony charge that he illegally used pepper spray on counter-protesters during the march, according to Phillips. Phillips said it is unbelievably galling that Ray has been active on social media and posting his podcasts online while defying court orders and withholding a trove of documents relevant to the litigation. Wow, this whole thing about just ignoring the courts and the law almost is like a virus with these maggots. And it starts from the head. Ray would be the second defendant in the civil case to be jailed after being held in contempt of court by Moon, Elliot Klein, who served as leader of a white nationalist group called Identity Europa, was briefly jailed in January for failing to comply with court orders. Mike Schneider, also of the Associated Press, brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A federal judge chastised government attorneys for failing to produce documents that showed how the U.S. Census Bureau made its decision to cut short by a month the headcount of every U.S. resident. U.S. District Judge Lucy Coe in San Jose told government attorneys that they were not complying with her order to produce administrative records during a hearing in a lawsuit over whether the once-a-decade census will finish at the end of September or the end of October. The documents that government attorneys had produced so far were already publicly available for the most part, she said. Co said she was very disappointed and surprised. I think that's just being rhetorical because she knows how this government works. When Co asked government attorneys whether they would ever be able to produce the documents before the end of the head count on September 30th, government attorney Brad Rosenberg said, We are not in a position to make that kind of statement. Really, no. Government attorney Alexander Sverdloff said the attorneys had been hampered by trying to review more than 8,000 documents in a short amount of time. We've been working around the clock on these issues, Sverdloff said. Co proposed a compromise in which the Census Bureau would instead turn over records it had previously given to the Office of Inspector General, covering much of the same decision-making process under the proposal... The judge would look at the records privately. If you are interested in a quick decision, this would solve everyone's problem, she said. 
and the government attorneys have not replied yet. this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A federal judge is considering whether to order Georgia to make changes in the way elections are run in the state with seven weeks to go before November's general election. Lawyers for election integrity advocates who filed a lawsuit challenging Georgia's election system are asking U.S. District Judge Amy Totenberg to order the state to abandon its new voting machines which are hackable, of course, in favor of hand-marked paper ballots, among other changes. They say Georgia's current election system does not allow voters to have confidence that their vote is accurately counted, which they argue is an unconstitutional burden on the right to vote. Lawyers for the state countered that Georgia has made great strides in recent years to update and secure its election infrastructure, so much that they've been just throwing millions of people off the, off the rolls. They shouldn't be thrown off. That's how they've made such great strides. The activists have not shown any real burden on their right to vote, and the changes there are demanding would be extremely costly and difficult to implement. Especially with early voting set to start in four weeks, the state argues, yeah, but those voting machines were okay just last week, so what's up? A three-day hearing on the activist request for immediate changes ended on Monday. Totenberg did not indicate when she would rule. Questions she asked throughout the hearing and during the lawyer's closing statements seemed to indicate that she was open to ordering at least some changes. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we'll finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. Starring John Provost as Timmy and, of course, Lassie. It's a classic television trope. Timmy has fallen down a well. Lassie can't save him herself, so she runs to find help. Actually, Timmy never did fall down a well in the entire run of the TV show. But the idea that a dog could seek help from a human does have a solid basis in science. In what's known as the unsolvable task experiment, a dog first learns how to open a puzzle box with a tasty treat inside. The puzzle is then secretly switched for another that's impossible to solve. After becoming frustrated, dogs shift their attention away from the puzzle and onto a nearby human, then back to the puzzle. The dog attempts to shift the human's attention to the puzzle as a request for help. Human infants do the same thing. Such efforts are called referential communication. So if dogs behave this way, you might expect the same from their close relatives, wolves. But when researchers tested wolves raised by humans, the animals just kept trying to solve the puzzle, never seeking help. Since the dogs and wolves were all raised the same way and by the same people, domestication must be responsible for the behavior. So researchers began studying other domesticated creatures. Other animal species, like for example horses, goats, 
have been tested in this test, but there were no direct comparisons with dogs. Paula Perez Fraga, an ethologist at Udvish Lorand University in Hungary. Pet cats respond more like wolves than like dogs. Cats are domesticated, but they are not social like dogs and wolves. Pigs, however, are social. When pigs live in the wild, or even like wild boars, these animals live in group, and they need to communicate with their con specifics to be able to live. Which is why the researchers decided to compare pet dogs with pet pigs. While the pigs revealed that they were capable of referential communication, they didn't actually turn to people for help. Once the task became unsolvable, they acted more like wolves, determined to find a solution on their own. The results were published in the journal Animal Cognition. What domestication means is, like literally, that there is a genetic change in the animal, in the species, from their wild relatives. And normally, this genetic change has appear because of human pressure. Most domesticated animals, including dogs, cats, horses, goats, foxes, and so on, show similar anatomical and physiological changes associated with domestication. But Fraga says her study shows that the domestication process can proceed along different pathways in different animals. And that could explain why domestication and sociality alone can't explain why dogs react the way they do when faced with an unsolvable puzzle. Fraga thinks that it could be related to their domestication history. Their domestication was different. Pigs has been domesticated normally, like mostly, for being as a meat resource. It was only later that we started treating some pigs as pets. Dogs, on the other hand, were treated as companion animals from almost the beginning, which appears to explain their willingness to ask for our help. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Colorectal cancer is the number two cancer killer of men and women in the United States, but it is preventable. Early on, colorectal cancer typically has no symptoms. It starts with a precancerous polyp or abnormal growth in the colon, which can be removed without surgery. Several tests are available to find these polyps, so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Screening also finds colorectal cancer early when treatment works best. Recommended screening for adults at average risk begins at age 50 and continues until age 75. Learn about screening test options and find out which tests are covered by insurance. Talk to your health care provider about when you should be screened and discuss the best tests for you. For more information about colorectal cancer prevention, please visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Russia is actively interfering again in the 2020 election. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And that was the conclusion of the Democratic senators contained in the 1,000-page report of the Senate Intelligence Committee released in August. 
The committee unanimously, on a bipartisan basis, concluded that Russia involved itself deeply in the 2016 U.S. election in order to elect Donald Trump president. There was one major point of disagreement, but not about that fact. The Republican senators emphasized in their addendum that the committee found no evidence that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. The Democratic senators highlighted that the report itself unambiguously shows that the Trump campaign cooperated with Russia. Cooperation with Russia versus collusion with Russia? Look, it is an important issue, but it's not the critical question today. The critical question today is how is Russia trying to influence the 2020 election? Using and manipulating social media, creating numerous false organizations and social media accounts, supporting third-party candidates who could change the outcome in closely contested swing states, more, worse? And critically, what is the United States government doing to prevent this foreign adversary from putting its thumb on the electoral scale? A question that needs answering now. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1931. That was the day that came to be known as the Invergordon Mutiny in Scotland. The global depression had begun to sweep across Europe. In response to the economic crisis, the British government began cutting the pay of public sector workers. This included those in the armed forces. This came at a time when more workers were joining the armed forces because of the rising unemployment that ravaged the private sector. For those in the Navy, the proposed pay cuts were 10% for officers and as high as 25% for those under the rank of petty officer. As news of the pay cuts spread, sailors at Invergordon held meetings to discuss their response. Invergordon, Scotland had become an important harbor for the British fleet during World War I. The sailors decided to strike. On the day of the strike, several ships were scheduled to participate in exercises. But the sailors on four vessels refused to take their ships out of the harbor. Many men did not report for duty. Naval leaders gave in quickly, reducing the severity of the pay cuts. But many of the leaders of the strike faced reprisals. Some were jailed. Others were drummed out of the Navy. Spies for the Admiralty went below decks to monitor the sailors and report those who might cause future trouble. Government leaders tried to keep the news of the strike out of the news. But workers' rallies against public sector cuts spread to cities like Glasgow and London. The strike also caused a panic at the London Stock Exchange. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We better hurry through the weather report and I'll just get right into it. Uh, currently we are expected to be a tad warmer than yesterday. We are under partly cloudy skies with smoky haze and a air advisory until uh, Thursday early. Highs near 85, winds light and variable. They'll have clear skies tonight, though with smoky haze. West uh, Westerly winds out of at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And sunny skies tomorrow, they say, winds out of the south-southwest. Highs near 85, winds out of the south-southwest at 5 to 10. And we should have some more smoke, and it and, uh, doesn't seem like we're going to have that clear skies. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County down here in southern Oregon has now increased to 971 with three dead confirmed. Ragweed pollen is considered low here right outside the window at the mothership. The regional air quality index is unhealthy at 175 parts per million. The daytime UV index is at 6, which is high. 
Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.13 inches. Visibility is down to 2 miles. Relative humidity is at 80%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased. Personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. It's an aggregate. Yes, it is. London is 84 and sunny. Paris is 93 and sunny. Rome is 90 degrees and fair. Kiev is 76 and fair. Kabul is 75 and fair. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 73 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 62 and clear. San Francisco, California is 58 and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit for a fall day that will be sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees at the Associated Press bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. An enormous chunk of Greenland's ice cap has broken off in the far northeastern Arctic, a development the scientists say is evidence of rapid climate change. The glacier section that broke off is 100. and 10 square kilometers, which is 43 point which is 42.3 square miles. The glacier is at the end of the northeast Greenland ice stream, where it flows off the land and into the ocean. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Tom Balmforth and Maria Tseskova of Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The ruling United Russia Party secured landslide wins at weekend regional elections, but suffered setbacks. In votes for two Siberian city councils contested by supporters of stricken Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny, results showed on Monday. Supporters of the opposition politician who was being treated in Berlin after being poisoned by a nerve agent made rare gains in Siberia, winning seats in the cities of Tomsk and Novobarisk along with other opposition groups. But pro-Kremlin politicians backed by Putin won or were heading for landslide wins to serve as governors of more than a dozen regions, including Komi, Tartistan, and Kamchika. They confirm the overall dominance of United Russia, which supports Putin, but showed a perceptible uptick in opposition support in parts of Siberia, well, Navalny had focused his attention before the poisoning on August 20th. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays indeed. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon 
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coupent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Qu'il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 